Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's <coughs> webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood. The Iowa History 101 webinar series, which focuses on the past lives of Iowans, continues on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will explore Iowa State University's groundbreaking, groundbreaking seed research from the work of early innovators such as Lewis H. Pamel and George Washington Carver to today's world-renowned Seed Science Center. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. And now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Mike Starr. Mike comes from a family farming lineage and currently lives on land that has been in his wife's family for more than 170 years. He's earned two degrees from Iowa State University, a bachelor's in business and management, and a master's in agronomy. Mac Mike began working at the Iowa State Seed Lab as a student, and in 2007, he became the lab manager. He has been president of the Association of Official Seed Analysts twice and has served on or chaired many communi communities in that group, as well as the Society of Commercial Seed Technologists. Mike has also traveled to Nairobi, Kenya, Kenya and Northern Ghana in support of the Seed Science Global Programs. But even after his 40 years of experience, Mike still learns something new in his fields every day. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Mike to begin the webinar. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present about George Washington Carver and about the Seed Lab. And so, as Jennifer said, the title is Quality Seeds to Feed the World, 130 Years of Seed Testing, Research, and Outreach. So this is what we're going to look at today. Um, George Washington Carver's time at Iowa State, which was also covered in the last very excellent uh, webinar in the Seed Lab's connection to him. Uh, brief history of the ISU Seed Lab. What is seed testing and why is it important to end users? And then we'll finish by looking at the Seed Science Center as far as an overview, research and outreach. And the picture you see at the right hand, bottom right hand corner of your screen is one of our student seed analysts and she's counting out a seed, which you may be interested to know, that's strawberry seed. So these seeds are so small, they get sucked into our planting heads. So our lucky students get to count out these seeds one by one. Now you'll see a little emblem pop up of somebody behind a podium. So I was just gonna say, I find it interesting that in seventh grade, a one minute or a five minute speech would terrify me. And now I'm having difficulty squeezing this into 45 minutes. Okay, so we're gonna start with George Washington Carver at Iowa State. Uh, in 1891, he came to Ames to study horticulture. He came from Indianola, from Simpson College to Iowa State. In 1894, at age 27, he became the first African-American to graduate from Iowa State College in a course in agriculture. In 1896, he earned a Master in Agriculture and Botany degree from Iowa State and he became assistant botanist for the experiment station. And we learned in the last webinar, he was very active with the greenhouses on campus. So then he was invited by Booker T. Washington to join the faculty at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And he accepted that later in 1896. So a lot of what George Washington Carver did, he wasn't working in the seed lab, but of course he worked with seeds an awful lot. He had to germinate them, he grew them out to plants. 
And a lot of his work was research and outreach. So he did the research and it was very important to him to share what he discovered with everyday people uh, down south. So he was dubbed the father of chemergy, which nowadays we call biochemical engineering, which is taking raw ag materials and converting them into non-food, industrial, and consumer products. He worked with cotton, peanuts, sweet potatoes, and many other species of seeds. You might not know, but he extracted pigments from different types of clay to produce house paints. And he also produced several types of paper, a synthetic marble made from wood shavings, a type of wood road paving made from cotton, and then an array of adhesives, greases, plastics, soaps, and cosmetics. And at the bottom there is the article that came from. So then we're gonna switch gears, the link between uh, George Washington Carver and seed science. Um, way back when it was seed, seed growing seeds and that sort of thing. More recent times, we've got a statue of George Washington Carver in front of our building. And we've got a, a alumnus, Paxton Williams, who many years ago, we had a, a meeting and then we had a banquet that same day. And Paxton dressed up as George Washington Carver. He's mastered Carver's voice. He told stories about Carver. And Paxton's favorite quote is pretty interesting. How far you go in this life depends on you being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and the strong. Because someday in life, and here he likes to add, if you're lucky, you will be all these things. So again, as I mentioned in the last slide, George Washington Carver's goal wasn't profit. Rather, he believed it was important that they all get into all his findings, all his research, get into the hands of the people who would benefit most from them. So here's a, the, a, a, a photograph of the statue in front of Seed Science Center with the surrounding little courtyard, flowers, plants. And then you'll notice there's a plaque to the left. And I took a picture and part of that plaque shows on your screen now. The statue is by Christian Peterson. If you're familiar with the Iowa State campus, Christian Peterson's got uh, paintings, in the library, he's got other statues on campus, very gifted. And this particular statue was cast in bronze in 2008 from a original plaster uh, pre 1949. And if you look very closely, uh, there he's holding something in his hands and that's a peanut, which is one of the many ag crops he worked with. So just as Carver, George Washington Carver recognized the importance of seeds. Nowadays, many of us recognize the importance of seeds. Uh, the American Seed Trade Association, or ASTA, their motto for many years has been first the seed. And here at Seed Science, we have the coin, the uh, saying, to feed the future, we must seed the future. And the reason that George Washington Carver statues got that mask on, we're proud that during this pandemic, uh, the seed lab never closed. We, the building was locked until August 1st, but we kept on testing. We were very safe. We did all the safety protocols. And we're just, I'm really proud of our staff and students that we kept on working right through the pandemic. So this being history, I thought it'd be kind of neat to look at early notable Iowa seed companies, uh, 1892. Two, Henry Fields begins to grow, harvest, and market seeds in Shenandoah. In 1918, the Earl May Seed and Nursery Company is founded in Shenandoah, and there's a picture that shows up on your screen of an early photo of that building. In 1926, Hybrid Corn Company was founded in Des Moines by Henry A. Wallace and Associates, and of course, that later became Pioneer. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now we switched to Iowa State. So in 1890, of course, George Washington Carver came a couple of years later. Uh, Dr. Pamel, and there's a Pamel Drive on campus, he's a professor of botany, initiated seed testing and research. And uh, 15 years later, in 1905, Dr. Pamel formally organized the first seed lab. A second seed lab was added in 1914 under Dr. Hughes in the Department of Agronomy. 
So we had two seed labs from 1914 to 1932. 1932, <clears throat> excuse me, under the leadership of Dr. Porter, these labs were merged and moved into Botany Hall. And so the seed lab moved from Botany Hall, and we used to call it Old Botany at that time, in 1977. So I came in 79. I just missed being in that building. And of course, now it's called Cary Chapman Cat Hall. And from what I was told uh, years ago in the basement, there were large sand benches. And then some of the other purity lab and so forth were in the upper floors. So people got a lot of exercise going back and forth between the different units. So in 1976, the Iowa General Assembly appropriated $1.86 million to construct a new seed lab at Iowa State University. And Iowa Crop Improvement donated 275000 towards the project. What's interesting is this, this drawing is from the uh, groundbreaking and so forth, the christening. And at the west end of our building now, there's growth rooms that were just finished a year ago. They're like greenhouses, but they're all closed in and bricked in. That growth room addition was a million dollars. And here, $1.86 million it took to build the original building. So construction was completed in 1978 on a 33,000-square-foot seed lab. And that's about a little before the time I came there. Okay, so now we're going to switch from history to why we test seeds. So, of course, the, the main reason we test seeds is when a farmer buys a bag of oats or alfalfa or a gardener grabs, buys some seeds lettuce seed or whatever, you want it to be lettuce, you want it to grow you know, reasonably well. So we provide a basis for the sale of seeds. And then as we've experienced in this spring, Iowa weather is not always consistent or always nice. And so there are problems that develop sometimes when that seed is produced. So basically for any question you can ask about seed, a seed lot or bag and seed, We've got a test that meets that. So, for instance, how much of a bag of seeds is the correct species? If you buy alfalfa, you want it to be all alfalfa if possible. And that's a mechanical purity test, which we'll look at in a few minutes. You want the seed to be the desired variety. We love uh, incredible seed corn. We've got three gardens at our, our farm. And we would like to have our sweet corn be incredible, for instance, even though there's many other very good varieties. <clears throat> uh, if there's biotech seeds present, I mean, sometimes if you're a farmer, you want Roundup Ready soybeans, you want it to be all Roundup Ready soybeans. If you're like organic seeds, then you don't want the GMOs to be there. And then there, you can just see there's a number of other questions we can ask, and there's a test to meet that. So we, we test for the label. That's the main thing we do. Um, if seeds stay in Iowa, then the Iowa seed law, if it's produced in Iowa and stays in Iowa, the Iowa seed laws apply. The minute that seed crosses into Missouri or Minnesota, whatever, then the Federal Seed Act applies. So on this sample uh, bag tag, seed tag, this is kind of typical. This is on alfalfa. And... This information by the red line is the purity information. So a seed analyst goes to about 2,500 seeds, one at a time. Of course, corn's easy. Alfalfa's a little harder. Begonia seeds are like dust. They're harder yet. But this particular alfalfa was 99% uh, alfalfa. And then the germination information, if you look at the germination, it's 63%. You might be thinking to yourself, boy, that's really bad. Well, actually, if you include the hard seed, which is seed that's capable of growing, but it's not because it's dormant, that's 31%. So you combine those figures together, and the total viable seed for that seed lot is 94%. So what's not on the label is seed health information. Most of the seed health testing we do here at Iowa State is for export, but we have these wet springs or wet falls. We do a lot testing on soybeans and so forth that have health issues. Uh, vigor testing, so the germination test, that's what the label information, that's ideal conditions. But again, Iowa tends to have cold, wet springs. So we've got a test called the cold test and other tests that 
gives you an idea how well that seed will do under poor conditions. And then biotech trait purity, again, if you're planting Liberty corn or Roundup soybeans, you want it to be those, have those genes, but that does not appear on the label. Okay, so at Iowa State, we offer more than 50 testing methods. That's not unique to Iowa State. Some do more testing methods, some other labs, and some do less. And these tests you see on your screen, they're kind of color coded. So anything that's in blue is a germination type test, what's in black or a purity type test, what's in red is health testing, and what's in green is a GMO type test, just to give you an idea. So a little bit about this Iowa State University Seed Lab. <clears throat> We're a member of the Association of Official Seed Analysts or AOSA. That's a group of state labs, uh, federal labs, and some crop improvement labs. And then there's a group called SCST, Society of Commercial Seed Technologists. And those are analysts from private labs and commercial labs and some official labs. Anyway, those two groups together, we certify seed analysts that they're know what they're doing for purity testing or germination testing. And then SCST alone certifies genetic analysts. So at Iowa State, you'd expect for us to do a lot of corn and soybeans, and we do. That's our, I'm sure that's our main crops. But we do more than 300 species of seeds, uh, vegetables, grasses, flowers. We used to do a fair number of palm trees, uh, cactus seeds. And what you're seeing on the right on your screen, there's a retailer that was marketing these types of plants in their displays well, it was a key that those seeds not germinate. So we, we plucked the seeds off of these plants and we germinated them or, or exposed them to germination conditions to see if they would grow. So we do much more than corn and soybeans. Our seed health testing is actually the figures over more than 400 pathogens we check to facilitate the movement of seeds. And actually instead of being 800 million, it's over a billion dollars to the United States to uh, market seeds overseas. And then we're a partner with Iowa Crop Improvement Association. Iowa Crop makes sure the genetics are good on corn, soybeans, oat, and other species. And then we do their germination testing and that sort of thing. We have a secure web locker system. When I came to Seed Lab, we still use typewriters. Typewriters are gone, but even we don't fax things anymore, really. We either uh, scan them and email them or we have a secure web locker where people can check their results 24 seven. So we have internal seed lab or internal labs rather at the seed lab, um, a seed health lab we'll talk about here briefly. These are soybeans and what we call a blotter health test. All these white things, they're uh, phomopsis or pod and stem blight that's coating those seeds. Uh, mechanical purity, I ex explained that a little bit where the analysts look at about 2,500 seeds by weight. Our germination lab is split into a large seed lab or large seed germination where we do corn, soybeans, peas, that sort of thing. And the small seed germination where we'll do flowers and alfalfa and grasses. And then the trait lab or a GMO lab, depending on how you prefer to say, where uh, we check for biotech traits. What's pictured in this picture is this is Liberty uh, corn. So this nice seedling has got the Liberty gene. And when you sp expose it to Liberty herbicide, it grows just fine. If it doesn't have a gene like these three seeds, then it doesn't kill the seeds, but it produces symptoms. So we know that gene is not there. So again, this, this is with the historical society. So I've got some then and now pictures for you. Uh, the photo to the left is in Botany Hall. They're working on purity testing. And actually I've got one of these dissecting scopes here in my office. And this photo to the right is Tessa, one of our current seed analysts. And she's using something that's much easier on the neck. Instead of bending her head to look through a dissecting scope or a microscope, uh, a camera is on this device and, and it displays what she's working on on the monitor. It takes a little getting used to, but it's much easier 
on her neck. If we look at the germination lab, again on the right, here's a photo, I assume from Botany Hall. This person is using a vacuum planner. There's a hundred holes on her vacuum head. She can adjust the amount of vacuum for bigger or smaller seeds. The kicker is if you have too much vacuum, you get three seeds on every hole. If you turn it down too much, when she tips it over, it's going to fall all over the place. And you can see what a good job she's doing as the seeds are all lined up. And this left picture is from probably just last year. Uh, one of our, another one of our student analysts, she's using a vacuum planter. This one's plastic instead of metal. And she's going to plant those seeds on top of water paper. This picture, the lady to the right, I'm pretty sure she's one of the gals I worked with when I first started in 1979 as a student employee. Uh, she's looking at seedlings on top of blotter paper. You can see the old germinator behind her. Basically what we do, some species like corn, we look at once. It's a seven day test. Other species like say bluegrass, we look at once a week for four weeks as we allow those seeds to grow. And we remove the good seedlings and take off the moldy seeds. This left picture is the, another one of our students, Taylor and she's working on petunia seeds. So you can see how small those seeds are. And we can't use a vacuum planter because if we put them on that vacuum planter, all the seeds will be sucked into the vacuum system. So the, our lucky students get to plant those seeds one at a time on paper towels or on blotter paper. One more photo from germination. That's another one of our students. She's got a different size planting head you can see because it's going on these large towels. So the, so the picture on the right shows wheat. Uh, with wheat, it's a seven to a 10 day test, but we do a first count at four days. So if you look at this photo, there's a nice development on these seedlings. They could be removed as normals. There's less development on this seedling. So by the end of the test, it may be a bad, what we call abnormal, or may develop into a good seed. And then here's a seed that's either dead or it's dormant. I mentioned vigor testing. So uh, there's a number of vigor tests we do. We do just a regular trade cold test we developed at Iowa State. This is called a saturated cold test. It's a much more severe cold test as the, sound, as the name sounds, saturated, being really wet's not good uh, in normal circumstances. So basically we have a liter of water in this pan, the paper towels wick the moisture up to straight soil. We plant 200 seeds of, in this case, corn. There's three different samples on this tray. Uh, seven days at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, like a cold, wet Iowa spring. And then three days at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And we look at those uh, seedlings to see if they're vigorous, if they're alive and so forth. One of the really neat tests we do is called a tetrazillium test or a TZ test. So again, with corn, which is pictured here, it's a seven day test, it's no big deal. I mean, sometimes people want the results yesterday type of thing. But for things like a tree seed that might take a month and a half to germinate, some of our customers may wanna know, get a rough idea of the germination and not wait a month and a half. And so this is uh, corn that it was imbibed overnight in wet paper towels. It was cut in half very carefully and dropped in tetrazoleum solution. And tetrazoleum solution stains living material. So you can see this corn kernel, the uh, white area is starch, is, that's dead material, it's not living material. It didn't stain. But where it points to shoot, those are the shoot, the multiple leaves that pops out of a corn seedling and then the root at the bottom. So this is like a perfect corn seedling, perfectly uh, germination, perfectly vigorous. The seed on the right, you can see it's got some really major troubles. The only part that's alive is clear up at the top here. So the leaf is dead, the roots are dead, the starch has got great big holes in it. So this would be non-viable or dead. So health testing is another area very fascinating to me, even after 40 some years. Um, there are seven basic health tests we do to detect over 400 different pathogens. 
on corn, soybeans, vegetables, cereal, and flower seeds. What's pictured in the upper left is what's called a lateral flow strip. And that overlaps with COVID because actually lateral flow strips for COVID are, have been used during the pandemic. This lateral flow strip is used for detecting a pathogen. When one line appears, it means that the strip is working. When two lines appear, it means that pathogen is there. The middle picture shows uh, spores from a fungus called, Hel used to be called Helminthosporium, then Colchia bolus. But anyway, for old timers like me, if you remember back in the early 70s, there was Southern corn leaf blight that wiped out a bunch of the US corn crop. And this is related to that. This is not the same species, but it's related to that. This next picture is an auger plate or some people call it agar. It's like kind of like gelatin, kind of a jello type substance. And these are fruiting bodies from a type of fungus. In your lower left is a soak test. We're soaking those seeds in water or buffer to see if there's bacteria in there. If there is, we, we apply it to a different type of plate. You can see the streaking that one of the people did to streak that liquid onto the plate. And then we can use the upper right, you can see it's a pepper plant and they're probably putting some of that liquid into that pepper plant to confirm their diagnosis from the other test. And finally, in the bottom right, these are called blotter health tests. That's like that first picture I showed you two or three slides ago of the soybeans. And you can just see all the different, there's four boxes per sample and the seeds are surface sterilized and then they're planted on the seed, on the blotter. And after a week or so, we look to see what fungus or fungi come out. Switching to our trait lab or GMO lab, if you rather, uh, a lot of what we do is herbicide bioassay testing. So we saw the corn that was Liberty corn a few slides back. This is Roundup Ready corn or glyphosate tolerant corn. It's got the gene and when you expose it to Roundup, it grows just fine. But these three seedlings don't have the Roundup gene. When exposed to Roundup, they get these white shoots and these short, stiff roots. And down below is canola. And it's very similarly, if it's got the gene, it has nice root development. If it doesn't have the gene, the roots are stubby. <clears throat> and again, here's the lateral flow strips. I mentioned that for health testing. These strips are for Roundup Ready. So we could grind up seeds, add some water, pop in these strips. And again, one line means the strip is working and two line means it's detected uh, the Roundup bio or a protein. The upper right is ELISA. Again, this has some links to COVID as far as the testing they do. We use these ELISA plates. If we're gonna make sure there's BT in present, each well represents a corn seedling. We're checking to see if it's got the BT uh, trait in it. Okay, <clears throat> so legalities, I mentioned earlier about uh, seed that crosses the state line, the federal seed, Act applies to it. And this photo I have here is of the Federal Seed Act regulations, the total regulations. This photo shows the seed testing regulations specific to how many seeds we have to test and how long the test is good for and that sort of thing. And then we also saw a tag in the earlier slide. This slide is of wheat and from Georgia apparently. And again, it's got the purity information, 95%. So it's less pure than what that alfalfa was. And the germination is 75. And unlike the alfalfa, there aren't any dormant seeds. So the top germination of this wheat is 75. And then I'll have you notice this what's called a noxious weed exam, which is based on 25,000 seeds. And apparently in Georgia, wild radish, is especially bad and it's a noxious weed. So we're gonna to switch to the Seed Science Center. I borrowed this slide um, and I thought it's really neat the way they did this, showing the world with, it was like wheat seeds. Um, the Seed Science Center is a global center, excellence in seed science technology and systems. <clears throat> uh, it's part of the college of Ag and Life Sciences at Iowa State. 
And our focus is teaching, research, and extension. And again, that's our link to George Washington Carver, you know, the research, the teaching, and the extension. We have about 135 uh, faculty, affiliated faculty, staff, and students uh, connected with seed science. Some are based in the building, some are based in other buildings. The areas are seed pathology and seed physiology, <clears throat> which are research labs, our global seed program, our seed testing lab, a curriculum development, which could be the online masters or our college classes, seed conditioning, biosensing and information technology, risk management, seed health, and molecular quality assurance. So looking at the Seed Science Center, uh, research and education and training to develop tomorrow's leaders. One of the super neatest thing about working here is working with students and seeing those students uh, graduate from Iowa State and go on into the seed industry or other uh, professions. We have a national seed health system that Iowa State uh, works with APHIS. It was developed with our two units working together. It's a really neat system because when seed companies or labs are certified under the National Seed Health System, they can do their own sampling of seeds and they can do some of their own testing. <clears throat> and another nice thing about the National Seed Health System, it helped make the testing methods more uniform. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have an online master's program we'll talk about in a few minutes, and then also our global program. So looking at our research components, we have a seed pathology section, as I mentioned. They do a lot of work on many things, but Dr. Gary Monkfold, who's the professor in charge, um, some of his specialties are aflatoxins and mycotoxins. So I inserted this photo <coughs> of a German, <coughs> germination test, excuse me. Um, you can see the back half is soybean seedlings that look nice. The front half are seedlings that don't look nice. And they have a fungus called Aspergillus flavus on them. Sometimes aflatoxins are in that Aspergillus flavus. The photo at the right shows roll towels. People, some people call these rag dolls. Um, probably for there's probably wheat seeds inside of those towels. And this fluffy stuff growing out is fusarium or wheat scab. And there may be mycotoxins present in that. In our seed. <clears throat> physiology section under Dr. Susanna Goshi. Um, she's done a lot of work in her grad students on organic things like organic seed treatments because for organic crops, you can't use the chemical seed treatments. And what they've been specializing in lately is cover crops and sustainability overall. So the photos you see are on the left, uh, corn plants, rows, and then in between a cover crop. And the second photo shows the same thing you can see the cover crop down in between and then the corn. The corn will be harvested and the cover crop will keep the soil in place and use the nutrients and so forth. So now we'll go from research to outreach, <clears throat> uh, extension workshops and online master's program. So in 1903, the first county extent, extension plan in Iowa was established by Perry Holden and Jay Shambaugh. And then later he, Holden uh, established boys corn clubs, which later evolved into 4-H, which we're all familiar with what a great organization 4-H is. Uh, short courses and seed corn gospel trains in which he promoted hybrid corn throughout Iowa. And that's something what George Washington Carver did uh, there's a story about George Washington Carver that I haven't been able to find again, but I was told that uh, at one time, tomatoes weren't very popular down south. They're part of the nightshade family. And part of the things that George Washington Carver did was to go around showing people what a good uh, crop tomatoes are. <clears throat> and in 1905, the Ag Extension Act was passed in Iowa. So the photo at the top, the gentleman to the right is Dr. Uh, Leroy Everson, who's my first boss here at Seed Science. It looks to me like this is a short course. I don't believe it's a college class. I think it's a short course, probably with seed company people, and they're doing purity tests there in Botany Hall. The bottom right photo is uh, in Kenya, 
at the veterinary campus where we did our, our training and they're lecturing on something. I'm not sure what they're covering. Um, we do a lot of workshops at the Seed Science Center, well, at least in non-COVID times. Um, here at Iowa State and overseas, we do seed quality workshops, full week workshops on purity testing, full week workshops on germination, a lot of conditioning workshops. And then overseas, we do a lot on seed certification, plant variety protection, phytosanitary, and so forth. <clears throat> so one thing, we're, another thing we're doing a lot is it's college classes. We have a course called Agronomy 338, which is seed technology, which is taught by Dr. Susanna Goji with his help from other people. Um, it's a very popular class. In non-COVID times, the students, they attend lectures, they attend weekly lab sessions, which might be germination, conditioning, that sort of thing. And then they visit local businesses, seed conditioning plants and that sort of thing. Uh, with COVID, we still did the labs. There were less of them and we socially distanced, but we realized the hands-on is a very important part of what we do. Uh, seed conditioning, we've got a conditioning tower, which is a small version of what you'll find at many seed companies. Uh, we probably have more different types of equipment than a normal seed company, but they're, they're scaled down version. So this left photo, I believe, is Agronomy 338, a snapshot of that where they're looking at some machinery. So they do workshops during the summer. This is Alan Gall, who's in charge of that unit. Workshops like every week during the summer during a non-pandemic year. <clears throat> the academic classes I mentioned, agronomy and, and ag engineering. And then they support research. The students might, the grad students, do their growing during the summer, their seeds, and then during the winter, they can clean the seeds and they can do their germination testing and so forth. <clears throat> uh, another thing we do a lot of is tours, and that is what's really neat. I, I like to meet people, not only our students, but visitors. Our tours can be high level tours with uh, people like uh, Governor, former Governor Vilsack and other professionals like that. Or it might be a school group, which is the bottom left-hand picture is a school group from Boone looking at some soybean seedlings. <clears throat> then we go to our online master's program. So at the Iowa State University Seed Science, we've got a online master's unique around a world and that it covers both seed technology and business. You might, there are other courses, there's seed technology or business, but not where you combine the two. So we've had students from 13 countries and 22 states. And on the right, you can see some of the courses. There's a seed science component, a seed technology component, and business administration, and the creative component, which would be like a mini thesis. Again, COVID kind of messed things up for us. Normally we have a week short course in the fall about seed technology and a short course in the spring that's on business. With COVID, we switched gears and this unit put on a webinar. So we have a seed technology webinar last November, 360 registered and the average 89 um, attended. And what's neat, just like the historical society is doing, after the fact, people can go and look and view those uh, presentations. <clears throat> and just this month in April, we did our business management webinar, 446 people registered, 33 countries represented, and from five continents. So that's pretty neat. So we'll finish up with international. Um, here's the image of the world. Uh, you can see 80 uh, programs in 80 countries in the past 20 years. You can tell from the map that we do a lot in Central America, South America, uh, Africa, and then in India, Philippines, that sort of thing. So this global program has got a number of uh, primary areas, seed research and innovation, seed enterprise development, places like in Africa, seed policy and regulation, capacity building for seed systems, 
and biosafety of biotech derived seeds. So I'm, I'm gonna give you a couple examples of our projects. Um, we have a, this project, Seed and Price Management Institute in Nairobi, Kenya. Really neat program for three years. Me and some of my uh, associates went over. Uh, we taught a week of seed testing, a week of conditioning, a week of policy and that sort of thing. Uh, generally, there's 30 to 40 people that attended those courses from all throughout Africa. And the second thing that went on with this is they built this, designed and built this conditioning plant. So the money came from the Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation has many great things. And you see the, what the objectives were. <clears throat> the second one I want to key on is in Ghana. I traveled to Ghana once, and then my coworkers traveled a couple of years after that. This was funded by USAID. And basically what we did, I went over the first year and visited the seed labs they had that were usually with their government warehouses. We wanted to re-equip those seed labs, and we wanted to build brand new seed labs. So we got to help design those seed labs, and then they built uh, three seed labs over in northern Ghana. The bottom photo shows Jessica Blake, one of our co one of my coworkers, one of our seed analysts. She's in one of those new seed labs, and she's showing some people. Looks like a purity test of some sort. <clears throat> and then the upper photo, we had uh, folks from Ghana come over to Ames, and they did some training here at the Seed Science Center, you see they're looking at corn. So the objectives were to increase the availability and use of ag technologies, and as I mentioned, build seed labs and so forth. Finally, one of the, one of the really neat, neat things that have come about the last few years, we have a six part film series titled Seeds, Diversity of Wonder, which has won many awards. Um, it's located, you can actually view this. If you go to the Seed Science Center website, you can view this six part series from the website. So the upper right shows our uh, Seed Science Center newsletter. It's got some information about that uh, series. You can see the awards it got. It's got the website down below here showing some information about that. But it covers some really neat things. Such one thing, for instance, is the artist that uses plants and seeds in, in his, his work. And so he's in the process, he's learned a great deal about structures and so forth of plants and seeds. Uh, I Hopefully you're all aware of the World Food Prize, the beautiful facility, the World Food Hall that's in Des Moines. And they have the World F Food Prize festi festivities every fall. And in conjunction with that, we have a seed Global Seed Symposium. I believe the Seed Health one got postponed because of COVID, but I think that's going to be held this coming fall. But in 2019, we covered Seeds Diversity of Wonder, which is that film series. And you can see we talked about sustainability and so forth. Here's just a couple of images from our newsletter. As uh, Grace Kazoo, that used to be a grad student here, she had an article African women in agriculture, putting food on the table every day. The second uh, thing you're seeing is an article I wrote, uh, Iowa State University International Seed Science Center. And I would say, yeah, we are very much international. And this is uh, me with a couple. Uh, Antonio used to be a grad student here. Now he's moved on to other things. And then Brent Reshley was an undergrad and he works with a seed company. So we're former co-workers, and this is us over in Cologne, Germany at a meeting of the International Seed Testing Association. Okay, that's what I had to present, but some really neat resources. I would have showed you a video, but I don't trust my technical skills. <clears throat> this seed testing, AKA testing seeds, 1939, you can see the link on YouTube. This is such a neat video. It shows a seed lab over in Cambridge, England, and it shows the way they did things back then, which looks a lot like what we did at uh, Botany Hall. Some things they did back then, and we do exactly the same way nowadays, and some things is completely different. So I'd urge you, if you have a few minutes, it's like a three-minute video. 
if you'd like to see that. The top link goes to the AOSA SCSD website, and they have a video series on seed testing, which is equally pretty neat. Uh, besides the videos, there's neat things like from the USDA on a guide to understanding seed tags. You can see the link there. <clears throat> and finally, we've got, of course got our website, our websites. And so for the Seed Science Center, the website is seeds.iastate.edu. The Seed Lab is part of Seed Science, uh, but we have a separate web page, seedlab.iastate.edu. And then the STB, Seed Technology and Business Graduate Program, has a website, seedgrad.iastate.edu. And of course, you gotta have Facebook and Twitter so you can see ISU SeedSci and add ISU Seed Grab. So thank you. Uh, uh, answer any questions you might have in a few minutes. I put in a couple more photos. This photo is me in Nairobi uh, during one of our lab sessions. Uh, the image to the right is a student who attended one of our short courses who's got way more artistic ability than I've got. And she drew this up for me and presented to me at a uh, conference later on that star is a star. And you can see the corn seedlings and like George Washington Carver and his peanuts, it's me holding my corn seedling. And if you'd like to contact me again, there's way more than what I could cover in 45 minutes. You're welcome to email me at mgstar at iastate.edu. So again, thank you. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And a quick note. Uh, that the links and your resources there will be included within our post uh, talk email that goes out uh, with the recording as well. So uh, we have a few minutes to answer some questions at this time. Um, however, before I pose our first question, I want to remind our participants that you can still submit your questions to the Q&A feature. Uh, we are on a schedule though, as always. So please note, we may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar. Now here's our first question. It's about the history essentially. Uh, is there a correlation between ISU being a land-grant university and the development of the Seed Lab? Oh, I think there is. So that's an excellent question. So on campus, there's a building called Moral, Moral Hall. And of course, there was the moral uh, law that was passed way back when. That's why uh, there is a Moral Hall. That's why Iowa State came about, because Iowa State is a land-grant university. So I definitely think the funding from the federal government really went a long ways to encouraging things like research and the seed testing and, and other research. Uh, a nice question, what are some of the seed pathogens most worrisome to Iowa farmers or gardeners or most common here? Okay, well, and actually, uh, even though Iowa generally is not known to be a big cereal state, you know, wheat and that sort of thing, uh, that's kind of changed because with the cover crops, we, we do a lot of rye. And so ordinarily a fungus called Fusarium wouldn't be a concern, but since we grow a lot of rye for the cover crops, it is. So I would say one fungus would be Fusarium and that's mostly for corn, for wheat. Uh, for soybeans, there'd be the Phomopsis that I mentioned, a pod and seed decay. Uh, another one would be called white mold. I think uh, the, those who are farmers watching this webinar might be familiar with that. It's called sclerotinia, is the fungus. And one of the problems with sclerotinia, it produces fruiting bodies that can stay alive in the ground for a lot of years. Corn, for the most part, does pretty well. There's some fungus, fungi that attack it, uh, like a Stewart's well, and that's not actually a bacteria, it's not a fungus. But, but as far as a home gardener goes, and I, again, I'm a home gardener too, I think the fun fungi that really affects me the most is on my tomatoes. And that's why it's so great to be able to buy vegetables that have disease resistance bred into them. That's perfect, thank you. Um, next question, how does the advancement of GMO impact seeds and seed testing? Well, and again, this is Mike the old timer. So me being associated with farms, you know, Roundup herbicide was out before there's ever any GMOs. We used to walk 
soybeans using spray bottles and would be very careful to spray the Roundup on the weeds and not the soybeans. And then the Roundup Ready soybeans came out so we could just spray to our hearts. Well, I shouldn't say it that way. We spray the plants, soybean plants and the weeds and only the weeds would die. So, so the way it's impacted the seed lab, of course, we've got a different type of testing now. Until the mid 90s, we did, there were no GMO testing. And actually I was the GMO testing person at the seed lab for a number of years. So it opened a new testing area for us, uh, another way to serve our seed company and our farmers. And of course the farmers it benefits a huge deal because uh, gone are the days when farmers have to cultivate repeatedly to cultivate out the weeds. They can spray the field and the weeds die and the plants, the crop plants live. Uh, Julie wrote in, Julie noticed that bird, plant, and insect habitats have disappeared in the last 40 years in rural crop farms. Um, how does testing for purity and eliminating weeds impact diverse habitats in farming fields? <clears throat> well, and it was, what's interesting, uh, on our farm, we've got a pollinator field. So thanks to, uh, the, to the federal government and the state government, you know, some of these uh, bees and birds and some things are making a comeback for instance, the pheasants for one thing, because there's so much more coverage than what there was a number of years ago. And so that's actually affected our testing because uh, on corn and soybeans, it takes less effort to do a purity test as compared to wheat or Kentucky bluegrass or whatever. And so I, I think our testing lab here at Iowa State and other labs have helped encourage people to plant these different crops and these cover crops and the set aside CRP because we're getting so much better at testing. The thing about some of the uh, things in the pollinator fields, you know, basically a weed is a, is a type of plant in the wrong place. So something that might be a weed like a milkweed in a cornfield is not a, a weed at all in a ditch or so forth. And so uh, we do a lot of testing of things that used to be weeds. Now they're actually crops. Um, during the seed testing, what are the important factors you ensure happen in order to assure a sample? Like do sample protocols vary with type of seed, type of test, et cetera? Okay. Well, that's another good question. A very good question. So uh, in the rules that we follow, AOSA rules uh, that we're required to follow, there are more like 850 species listed in there, which sounds pretty impressive until you think about there being thousands and thousands of species. But those 850 species, there's procedures on how to germinate it, how to identify them, and that sort of thing. So we do have procedures we follow. Not all species are in that rule book. So we work with other labs to find methods that will work and, uh, one step further, when we do this figure test I was mentioning to you, uh, to the people listening to this, we do what's called controls. So we, we have samples that we know are good or we know are bad. And we plant those along with our service samples to make sure everything's right, the temperature, the moisture, and so forth. So you talked about this briefly during the discussion, but a little bit more, how has testing methods uh, change over time other than like new technology? Well, they, they, they get refined. And so what, what's interesting is for some species, we can plant on, let's say, four different types of substrates, sand alone, blotters, paper towels, whatever. And part of the reason why we had the options is years ago, the seed labs only had like one substrate, let's say sand or they only had one temperature of possibility, say 77 Fahrenheit. But as we do more and more research, we find out there's other ways we can test that seed. So the methods do evolve. And actually some methods that were popular 100 years ago are less popular now. For instance, a method that just came about, a substrate is agar, agar. It's been used for health testing, but now we can plant tomato seeds on agar so instead of putting them in sand or in blotters, we put them on a special kind of, of more or less jello. 
and it makes it much easier to germinate the tomato seed. Our next question, uh, does the seed lab work with the global seed vault in Norway? Yes, and the, <laughs> just so many good questions. Um, there's the global seed vault overseas, and then there's in the United States, in uh, Colorado, in Fort Collins, there's the US uh, more or less seed vault. And so, yeah, uh, we work with that. USDA works with it. In Ames, we have a plant introduction station, and there's plant introduction stations across the United States. And <clears throat> we work with them and the USDA and, and the people in Fort Collins works with that seed vault because we've got seeds they don't have in Greenland. And just like in the Middle East where they've had some you know, issues, of course, with, with wars and so forth, where some facilities have been destroyed, uh, their seeds from the Middle East and from other parts of the world, they're stored in Greenland so that once things settle down, they can put those seats back into those areas. Uh, this will be our last question for today. Okay. Um, and can anyone submit seeds to be tested? Yes. Yeah, we test. That's really neat. I mean, we test for small seed companies, big seed companies. We test for researchers and we test for farmers. So, yeah, no, we accept uh, testing from anybody. You can go to that website, that seed lab iastate.edu and it's got an explanation how to submit samples. Perfect. And with that answer, that's all the time we have for today's webinar. Thank you, Mike. I appreciated everything today. I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, also, thank you to everyone joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you are there, you can look into some of the other fantastic digital programs, such as our Goldie's Kids Club activities for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa, Sto excuse me, Iowa Story Series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Thank you all again for joining us today, and have a great afternoon. Look forward to virtually seeing you here again Thursday, May 13th for our next Iowa History 101 webinar. Thanks, everyone.